Hi, it is Thursday, November the 23rd, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Paul's letter to the Colossians. Today we're going to finally finish chapter 1. Yay! It's chapter 1, verses 24 to 29. Um, we've been through a lot of introduction, and then Paul has basically asserted uh, Jesus' identity as firstborn of all creation, the one who reconciles us with God. Um, and we've heard a little bit uh, of, of Paul's gospel. Um, and Paul's gospel is that we are reconciled with God through through Christ. Um, and, uh, well, and it continues. So let's hear what Paul has to say. Colossians 1, 24 to 29. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. So, do you follow all those words? <laughs> I can't tell whether Paul has said very little there or said a lot. Um... So he opens with, I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. <sighs> rejoicing in my sufferings. I, 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 I reference how, how I like Paul talks about rejoicing, rejoicing in our faith in the hard times, the difficult times. He was rejoicing in his sufferings. His sufferings in the context of this letter is that he is imprisoned in Rome. And we know from the way this letter started that he is having influence on the people in the household where he is under house arrest. So, in a sense, he's really glad for the difficult things that have happened because it has given him an opportunity to preach the gospel to those who haven't heard it yet. If, if he weren't being detained in Rome, then he wouldn't be able to, to share the gospel with these, with these people. And so he, he rejoices in that. Um, I suppose he creates a certain notoriety. Um, and so he give th gives thanks for his, for his suffering. I, I guess when I think of, of rejoicing in my sufferings, and I think of people who have, who have suffered, um, well, okay, so I, I, I think of, of those who are in um, grief support groups. And there are, there are people who have been devastated by loss, um, loss of, 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 of a parent, but, but a partner, a child. Um, and they are, particularly when it comes, in, in my experience, those, those who have lost a child, the, the grief is, is quite devastating when they meet and talk with somebody who's been through it as well. They find hope and a path through their unimaginable suffering into into a kind of in, into a healing i mean a kind of healing no it, it is a healing um and i also know some of those people who have lost um children or close to them who have been able to be part of these groups and help and so i think that they are when they're able to help somebody i think they're they're glad of it they're glad that you know i was able to help Stella, uh, in, in, in her loss, because my own, I was able to speak to Stella and, and, and more than that commune with like just time with Stella and, and, and Stella has been inspired and I've shared my experience and my wisdom and, and Stella is, is healing. And I am so glad that I was able to do that. I don't think that somebody says, I'm so glad that I have suffered so that I'm able to help other people while they're suffering. I mean, I hear about those people. But I don't know that I actually know them. Or maybe I do and I just doubt them. Because I'm a cynic. Um, again, I think of those 
people that I know who have lost children. And they're very glad to help somebody else who has lost a child. But I don't think for a second they think, wow, I'm so lucky that my child died so that I'm able to help these people. Like, no. But what I do take from that is God's invitation for us to use our experience to help others. Which isn't to say I think that God makes us suffer so we can help other people who suffer. I think the reality of, of our lives are we, we, we do suffer. Um, things do happen that, that hurt and the pain lingers and we struggle with that. I, so that's real. Now, that can cause us to shut down entirely. We can become cynical um, and, 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 and just refuse to engage with the world because I have been hurt so badly. I, I don't want to risk being hurt more. And more than that, I have been hurt so badly and I blame the bloody world for it. And therefore, I don't want to engage with the world. And I don't want to talk to people. And I, 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 So that is also a natural reaction. I have met people who have been there. I hear Paul's invitation to move out of that into a place where you might talk about rejoicing in your sufferings. I don't know that Paul is thrilled um, that he is under house arrest in Rome. I think if Paul could have avoided arrest, he would have. I don't think he went in there secretly going, well, I hope they arrest me so that I'll have, a, have access to, um, to, to, to to the people who are confining me, uh, have access to, to, to the staff, to the jailers, uh, that they might be... Um, that they might come to know the gospel of Jesus. Uh, no, I think I think he would have been very happy to avoid the house arrest, to avoid being 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 jailed. Um, but it's happened, and so how do I live my faith in this place? Instead of shutting down and going, well, I'll just do my time, or I'll wait until I get out. I'll do my work when I'm free. Right now, it's like I'm I'm shutting down. No, he doesn't shut his faith down. I think that's the invitation here. At least that's the kind of thing I would think about and, and wonder about those times when I, when my, I, when I might shut my faith down. Um, and there are times, there are times when I have, um, run myself too hard and I get tired or cranky. I get into what some of my friends would call a high-functioning depression. I, I'm not a diagnostician, and I don't want to take that name uh, easily. So, well, that's a depression I'm suffering. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. But I can shut down uh, in terms of uh, feeling connected. I just, I just focus on doing what I have to do. Now, when that happens, I say I focus on what I have to do because I'm tired, I'm cranky, I'm sore, and I just need... Mm. But I can also take that time and I can relate to other people who are doing the same thing, whether that's high-functioning depression uh, or just feeling hurt and sore and slightly abused by the world and therefore less inclined to care about the world. I can take that and, and share it with them and say, hey, I know exactly how you're feeling. Um, and here are my warning signs and this is what I do and try to get it. And, and I'm glad when I do that. So, so I... I, I Again, I, I'm glad that I'm able to do that. I don't think that I'm glad that I get into that rut, but recognizing that that rut is part of what happens from time to time, I'm glad that I'm able to be aware of it and help others be aware and therefore find healing a way out. Yeah, now I'm just blabbering. Um, so he says, I'm rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. Oh, and then, by the way, yeah, Paul does point that out. This isn't for me. <laughs> I'm doing this for you. Um, and I, so I assume for you is everybody too. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm doing this so you can learn from me. Uh, and in my flesh, I'm completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church. Yeah, so I'm doing it for the body. That's the church. So that, that that's you. Completing... What is lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting way of putting it. What is lacking? So I, I, I don't think of Jesus as, 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 as lacking. 
Um, but that's where the language gets tricky. So lacking afflictions. When you hear that, it's like, so Jesus didn't suffer enough on the cross? And so Paul is picking that up and suffering even more? Jesus didn't spend it, you know, a, a, an extended time incarcerated before he died? Like, I... But then if you look at the language carefully, the Greek does help a little bit, and, 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 and it's kind of vague. But, but the afflictions that we're talking about here are not, are not the afflictions, are not the sufferings on the cross of Jesus. So I don't think that he's aligning himself. I don't think he's saying he's suffering like Jesus suffered on the cross. The afflictions he's talking about are the challenges, the struggles, the difficulties in, in Christ's ministry. Right, that, that that word, the word that's, that that we translate as affliction, uh, afflictions, is never used to describe Jesus' physical suffering. Uh, it is used to describe his ministry from time to time, um, his frustration from time to time. Um, you know, so so I think what Paul is saying is that he is continuing Jesus' work because Jesus did it long enough, but more is better than less, right? <laughs> Um, so he's continuing it um, because Jesus was crucified, resurrected, then ascended. Um, someone's got to keep this work going. So, so basically, I think that's what he's talking about. So, so I keep doing the work uh, that Jesus was doing, um, and I, and I do that for you. I do that for 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 Jesus's body, for 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 the church. And here's the work. And he notes that he's been called by God to do this work, and that is. To make the word of God fully known. To make the word of God fully known. Now in John's gospel, the word is made flesh. Jesus is the word of God. So this is very, again, very much like John. Um, and Jesus, the word of God, is this mystery that's been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but is now revealed to his saints. A mystery is not a puzzle that you solve. The, the, the word we're using here. We translate it, so we're, we're using mystery. Uh, that, 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 that's a good word for it, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily get it entirely. So the thing is, when I hear mystery, I think of a thing that I can solve, right? Um, through deduction, inference, intuition, uh, I can on my own solve this mystery. And, I, and uh like a riddle. I can figure it out. I have that capacity. All right. That's not what we're talking about here. The mystery here is a thing that we might feel, but we cannot comprehend until it is revealed. Right? So, so there is a sense of God, right? Like we, we, we can, we can feel it. Um, and, and, and for Paul, um, the Jews would, 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 would have experience, but then after that they have stories and traditions. They have the scriptures. They have the holy books. They have they have the law. They have all of these things in which they work at working, living righteously, living in right relationship with with God, because they feel that that's the thing they should do. They don't know it. He would say, they feel it, um, and I think they're non non-Jewish, non-Christian, non-theist people, anyway, who also do feel a, feel that the arc of the universe bends towards beauty, okay, or towards justice. Um, just that idea that there is a, there is a goodness, a, a, a persuasion, a, a force that is, that is kind in the universe. Um, but we can't describe it, we can't comprehend it. That's the mystery. It's there, but I don't know how to comprehend it, I don't know how to express it. I don't even really know how to engage it. I do from time to time, but I don't know exactly how. And Paul would say, so his gospel is, is to say, and, but it's now been revealed in Jesus. That's why it's been revealed to his saints, those who, who are in the church, those who follow. Um, it's been revealed in Jesus. Jesus is that revelation. See, that's the thing. That, the, the word that we used here for mystery a mystery cannot be understood except by revelation. You can't puzzle it out on your own. And that's what's happened. That's what Paul is saying. There it is. Jesus. Now, God is not felt and unknown, but it is actually 
seen, and known. You can know God through Jesus. You couldn't know God any other way. You, you, could, you could get a bit of this, a little bit of that, but you couldn't know. So for Paul, what Paul's saying here is that Jesus is a complete revelation of God. There's nothing being held back. So if somebody else came along and said, well, yes, but I've learned this thing about God, and you couldn't learn that through Jesus, Paul would go, no, 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 that's, that's not God. It, it, it is, it, it, in Jesus, God's revelation is complete. You want to know what God thinks, you want to know how God feels, you want to understand the character of God, the will of God, discover it in Jesus. And that, for Paul, is the maturity I think he talks about, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He, he wants to help people Find God through Jesus, because that revelation is complete for him. Others would be just be partial and would remain a mystery. I think that's what he is saying. At least that's what it seems to me. Um, but the language is, is, is decidedly tricky. Uh, when he says that, you know, this mystery um, throughout the ages and generations now been revealed to his saints... To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this ministry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What the heck? That's, again, a whole bunch of words signifying nothing or signifying something. It sounds sounds a little mystical, sounds a little Gnostic even. Christ in you. Now that is a that is a thing with with with, with Paul, um, that I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. Um, but what does he mean with it here? I mean, it is he wh whom we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Mature. Mature is the thing I grow into. I'm not there yet. I'm going to get there. Or maybe I am there, but I wasn't always there, right? So you mature. Maturing takes time. Maturing is aging, right? Maturing takes time. You can't be instantly mature. So for me, Paul is talking about something that is a process. And I wonder when I hear these words, if, 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 what, if what Paul's inviting us into is becoming a revelation ourselves. So here's, here's my thinking. Here's my wondering. We recognize, if we, if we take it on faith, that Jesus is a complete revelation of God. You want to know who God is. You can see it all, get it all in Jesus. You, may not, you can't experience it all, but you can understand it all. It is The mystery becomes knowable. Now we talk about, and, and, and because, because God is in Christ and Christ is in God. But in faith, we are invited to have Christ in us and therefore for us to be in Christ, good language that we use. So is Paul suggesting that what we need is that, that, that as, we, as we grow in faith, we become complete revelations of Jesus. And therefore, revelations of God. Um, but we become revelations of Jesus. So if you want to know what Jesus is like, even if you've never read the Bible, you want to you want to get a sense of Jesus' character, the way Jesus would do things, you know, you just look at Norm. He's a Christian. And Norm, as a faithful follower of Jesus, is revealing Jesus. All the time. Always. 24-7. Um, that might be what Paul is inviting us into. That's the maturity. That's why we talk about this idea of this this this, this mystery being solved, this revelation being revealed. That that so so God is revealed in Jesus, and Jesus is revealed in Jesus's followers. So then again, we become revelations of God, I suppose, right? It's an interesting thought. And I'm not sure that the author of this letter, Paul or whoever it may be, is, is actually doing that math uh, the way I just did it. 
but it is an invitation for me to wonder. If you wanted to know about Jesus, what would you infer by looking at me? The way that I live, the things that I say, the things that I do, my values, my choices. Would you be able to recognize Jesus in me? Huh. Okay, now I'm rolling back to, gosh, I don't know, I think I was probably a teenager. Um, <clears throat> would have been a meme had we had memes in those days, but instead it was just a clever poster, I think, at a Baptist youth retreat I went to once. But anyway, it was something that, if, 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 uh, if, if, if believing in, in, in God was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or if being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Um, that's, I think that's what it was. What would you infer about Jesus if you met me? If you got to know me? Because I am, in that sense, revealing, as calling myself a Christian, I am revealing Christ to others. And Christ is the, is the revelation of God. So I am revealing God to others. Do I ever really think about that? Do I take it seriously? By the way, how am I doing? Well, I don't think I'm going to turn this into my, my own personal confession. So I'm just going to wonder about that myself. It's intriguing. Um, and again, I'm not sure that that's what this part of the letter is about, but, but that's what's got me wondering right now. And so I'm going to... I'm going to stop right now and do my own wondering uh, and leave it with you to do yours. Um, yeah, if being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Uh, more to the point, if I didn't know anything about Jesus or about God, but knew that you were a person of faith, what might I infer by looking at you and listening to you, watching you, um, being your friend? What might I learn? about God. Hmm. Anyway, let's let us pray. Loving God, thank you for the comfort of faith, but also the challenge of faith. As we wonder God, let us not be afraid to to challenge, to challenge ourselves to to be found wanting and then realize that you love us exactly as we are. That you love us as we learn and as we grow. You don't, you don't judge us for what we don't yet know, but you encourage us to grow. God, may this time of wondering be a time of, of growth. May we grow in faith. May we hear your word as it emerges from our wonderings. And may we follow that word. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's enough of me. Um, but I I wish you a great day today. Um, yeah, you can tell. I'm already starting to wonder. Like, oh my goodness, would anybody know? Uh, what, would the, what would you know about Jesus if you, if you, if you spent time with me? Oh, I may not always be Jesus' best advert. <laughs> I need to think about that. Uh, anyway, um, whatever you do, however you come out of that wondering, if you do that wondering, uh, please know that God does love you exactly as you are, the way you are. Doesn't mean you can't grow. Doesn't mean you can't change. Of course you can. But you will do that with God because God loves you as you are. And more than that, God's love moves through you into the world. You're already part of God's love and you matter a great deal. So God bless you and we'll see you tomorrow.